All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Steve Fink. I'm an Associate Athletic Director here at the University of South Carolina. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's press conference as we formally introduce our new baseball coach. Uh, for those of you media folks that were here yesterday, the format will be much the, uh, the same as it was yesterday. Uh, we'll hear from Athletic Director Ray Tanner, who will then introduce the new coach. Uh, at that time, Coach Maneri will make his opening statements and we'll open up for questions. Uh, following the press conference, uh, TVs will have one-on-one -on -one opportunities with the head coach um, over here to the left, as we did yesterday. And uh, at that time, we'll also make Coach Tanner and assistant coaches Monty Lee and Cherry Rooney available to the media as well. Uh, with that, I will turn the program over to Athletics Director Ray Tanner. Thank you for that golf clap. That was a little bit, a little bit weak. As I often do, I get off script at times. I promise you that I will be short. But uh, before we begin the announcement today, I'd like to introduce to you the first lady of baseball and the wife of our new head baseball coach, Karen Maneri. Please welcome Karen. We've had a few good talks already, so I look forward to that. Coach Maneri will be our 31st coach in the history of South Carolina baseball. As of today, he is the active leader in career wins in Division I baseball with 1,505 wins. Only one of five Division I coaches in NCAA history have won over 1,500 games and have a national championship by their name. At LSU, he won the 2009 national championship. He paved the way for others. In 2017, he was a national runner-up. Listen at the next stat. He made six College World Series appearances, five with LSU, one with Notre Dame. He won four SEC championships, six SEC tournament championships, and 10 NCAA regional championships. He was a two-time SEC Coach of the Year and a four-time National Coach of the Year. He was at LSU for 15 seasons. 11 of the 14 full seasons, remember we had the COVID interruption, he won 11 of 14 years, he won at least one championship. That would be either the regular season, the tournament championship, a regional championship, a super regional championship, or, an, or a College World Series national championship. His players have earned first team All-American recognition on 13 occasions. And he has 25 former players that have been in the big leagues. His coaching stints have been at St. Thomas University, Air Force, Notre Dame, and as I mentioned, LSU. He's won 70% of all the games that he's coached. That's the fourth highest winning percentage in SEC history, trailing only the legendary Skip Bertman, the young Tony Vitello from Tennessee, and another guy that you've forgotten already. <laughs> Under Coach Maneri, the Tigers earned NCAA national seed in six consecutive years. National seeds in six consecutive years. Only one other team in history has done that. That is Stanford. He's a member of the American Baseball Coaches Association Hall of Fame. And I'll share a, a fact with you that is solely from the Maneri family. His late father, Demi Maneri, who was a great coach in his own right, won over a thousand games. He's also in the American Baseball Coaches Hall of Fame. It's the only father-son combination in the American Baseball Coaches Hall of Fame. Let's give a round of applause for that. He served as head coach of the USA national team there's a lot of things about him, but I know what his priorities are. And certainly they are academics for his student athletes, relationships with fans and the community, and philanthropic endeavors. A couple of little known facts as I introduce our coach. Coach Maneri, a few years ago, as a student athlete, took an official visit to the University of South Carolina. Who in the audience knew that? He told me he had a wonderful time, a great weekend, 
and Coach Raines recruited the other two guys that he was with. <laughs> so this is not his first opportunity. Very briefly, a few people have asked me how this process came about. As I was going through the process, vetting candidates, and there were a lot of good ones that were interested in becoming Gamecocks, as you do, if you're in my shoes, you call people in the business that will give you great advice. So I reached out to Coach Maneri to see what he thought about some of the people that I had on my list. Knowing when I picked up the phone to call him that his name surfaced last year in a couple of other jobs. He'll tell you when he left LSU. I knew that he didn't leave the way that maybe he wanted to leave. I didn't know when I made that phone call whether he would even entertain the conversation or just tell me about the candidates I was asking him about. Of course, I wiggled my way into the conversation. How about you? He was very, very interested and excited about that. I felt that in listening to him and knowing him like I do, the last chapter had not been written. So I continued to put on my recruiting shoes in the next hours to come that led us to this day. So I'm delighted today on behalf of President Dr. Michael Amaritas, who's out of town in Washington today, and our chair of the board, the Honorable Thad Westbrook, to welcome and ask you to please join, in, join me in welcoming our new head baseball coach, Coach Paul Maneri. Well, let me make one quick uh, correction to that introduction. All those wins that he was talking about, I didn't win any of them. The players won them all. Let's make sure that we understand that very clearly. Uh, yeah, a week ago, I couldn't have imagined standing here at this podium and talking to you all about coaching the Carolina Gamecocks. Uh, but we never know what life will throw you. And Ray has been a friend for a lot of years. And when he called me, of course, we had a nice conversation. And he's still got the recruiting ability, I can promise you. But let me, let me say this, okay? Um, I was born to coach. And I've coached over 2,300 games. I grew up the son of a coach. It's all I ever wanted to do. When I was 14 years old, I went to my father and I said, Pop, I know what I want to do with the rest of my life. I want to be a college baseball coach like you. So he was a great mentor for me, besides a wonderful father, about the profession. And what, what he explained to me and what I've carried with me in my entire coaching career was that it's not about me. It's not about prestige. It's not about uh, publicity. It's not about making money. It's not about even winning games and, and the love of the game. It's all about the players. They don't create baseball programs so that I can have a place to work or Ray Tanner could have a place to work. They, they have them on college campuses so that gifted baseball players will have a place to develop their talents to their fullest potential and learn lessons that will later on go into their, they, that they will later on use in their lives so that they can become success, successful husbands, fathers, and uh, in whatever career fields in which they choose to, to partake. So this has been my vision about what my profession is about. It's, all been, it's always about the development of the young person. Now, if we do a good enough job recruiting talent and we coach them the right way on the field and we have that attitude about helping them develop, I just feel that the winning will take care of itself. And make no mistake about it, I like to win. And I make no apologies for that. In fact, I really hate to lose more than I like to win. But we'll always do it within the rules. We'll always do it with good sportsmanship, 
This is something I will demand from our players. And we will always do it with our players presenting themselves and conducting themselves in a way that will make the, the University of South Carolina very proud. I can promise you that. This is an exciting time for me. And, uh, you know, being in the Midlands is a lot better than being upstate. I know that. And uh, I'm looking forward to being here with everybody. I, I myself would like to thank Thad Westbrook for, from the uh, Board of, of uh, Trustees, what an, how he got involved and made this all happen, not only for me, but for our entire staff. Um, and of course, President Amaritas, uh, who I'm looking forward to meet in, in the future. But make no mistake about it, the reason that I came here is because of Ray Tanner. And I mean this very sincerely. Uh, what an awesome opportunity for a college baseball coach to have as his boss a good friend, one of the greatest coaches in the history of the game, and a tremendous administrator. And so this is a, this is a, the, the way I look at this opportunity is just like that. It's an opportunity, it's a privilege, it's not anything I will ever take for granted. And I appreciate the confidence that Ray has shown in me to make me the coach here at Carolina. You know, uh, I've had the opportunity prior to this to work at four wonderful institutions. I started at a small school in Miami, which was my hometown, St. Thomas University. You know, not, nobody really even knew we had a baseball program. So all I did was work with the players and enjoy, enjoy that part of it, the development of the players. After six years there, I had this uh, unbelievable opportunity to become the first civilian baseball coach at the United States Air Force Academy. You know, I'm proud to tell you and stand in front of you that five of my former players are general officers in the Air Force. And that's something I'm extremely proud about. You know, my, my uncle served as a bombardier in World War II. My father served in the Army. And when you're around the cadets at the Air Force Academy and around people that have served in our military, I can't tell you how much that makes you feel privileged to have opportunities to go out onto the baseball field and play, play a game that we love because of those people. So my time at the Air Force Academy was something that I will always cherish. And then I was perfectly happy there. Our family was growing. We were, we were enjoying ourselves. And six years later, out of the clear blue, I got a call from the University of Notre Dame. And I, you know, I thought to myself, you know, Notre Dame, of course, means our mother. I wanted to go to heaven, and I thought if I turned Notre Dame down, I might not get in on the first ballot. <laughs> so I thought I ought to do that. So we went to Notre Dame, and I'll never forget that press conference announcing my hiring. It was the first press conference I had ever had. And I'm sitting there just amazed, you know, that people cared enough about baseball. And the priest sitting next to me leaned over to me, and he said, Paula, I want you to know because we're a private school, you don't have to divulge what your salary is. And I said, don't worry about it, Father Bochamp. I'm just as embarrassed about it as you are. <laughs> so I was perfectly happy at Notre Dame. And I was there for, six, uh, for 12 years and had opportunities, you know, not, nothing that I pursued, but opportunities to go to some other places in the South, in the SEC, in the Big 12. Uh, but nothing appealed to me. I just, you know, I was happy at Notre Dame. We were raising our family, and, and we, we didn't ever want to leave. And then out of the clear blue, I got a call one day from Skip Bertman. And uh, Skip is a person I knew from my days of growing up in Miami, as he did. Uh, I think if Ray was up here, he'd tell you what a phenomenal person Skip is and, and, and what a molder of men he was and, and the influence he had on so many people. And he's a hell of a recruiter as well. So when I came down to visit with him, we sat down and talked for an hour. I said, Skip, look, I have a great job. I don't need this job. And we need to decide if this is the right thing for you and if it's the right thing for me. Well, we talked all day, and uh, I slept on it that night. And I took the job. That, you know, the next day, Karen and I talked about it the night before. And, and she asked me, you know, do you, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I think I want to take the job. And she said, why? And I said, because if I don't do it, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. And I don't want to go through the rest of my life regretting anything. 
I may crash and burn, but at least I'm going to take my swings. You know, when I, these players are here, they're going to hear me say this an awful lot of times. In the biggest games of the year, the most pressure on you, you cannot be afraid to fail. You've got to believe in yourself, and you've got to go out there and make it happen. You need to attack. Well, I started thinking maybe I ought to listen to that advice that I gave my players through all those years, and I ought to take this, this jump of faith, and uh, let's go for it. Well, I'm really glad we did. We had some success, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, Ray mentioned that I, it didn't end the way I wanted to. It wasn't because I was fired. It wasn't because I was forced out. But I, I was having some neck problems, and it was just physically uh, taxing on me. I was still a young 63 years old, but it just, you know, I was dealing with these issues. Well, we dealt with them after I retired. And as each year has passed by, this is the third year I've been out, I have felt better and better and better with each passing year. And right now, I'm standing in front of you at 66 years old, but believe me, that's just the number. I don't feel anything close to 66 years old. I feel like I'm 40 years old again. I am so excited about being here and doing this job. Um, I'm so excited about being part of the Carolina history and the tradition, the winning tradition. I can't wait to meet Don Staley. Uh, um, Shane uh, Beamer called me the other day. We had a nice talk. I can't wait to meet Lamont and all the other coaches. Ashley, I uh, watched her press conference yesterday. And it was, you know, just it's, it's a place that's filled with champions and people that want to do things the right way. And I'm just so excited about the whole thing. Nothing would be possible in life without family. And I have been so blessed in so many ways professionally, but the greatest blessing that I have in my life is my family. You've already been introduced to my beautiful wife, Karen. You know, we've only been married for 44 years, so we're not sure we're going to make a commitment to each other. Um, she's been with me every step of the way. And whenever I've had these other opportunities, you know, I, I say to her, you know, what do you want to do? And her response has always been, Whatever you want to do, I'm right there with you and will support you in every way. Actually, this opportunity, she was pushing for me to do it. <laughs> she, uh, she knew that there was something missing in my life and that I needed to take another, another sh uh, shot at it. And uh, fortunately, it worked out. But we're, you know, she's been the backbone of our family. You know, when you're a coach and you have a young family like my children were at one point. They're not so young anymore, but you know, you can't survive in this profession unless you've got someone at home who is, uh, is strong and a wonderful mother and, and just a very supportive person. And you know, she essentially raised our children and they're, they've all turned out unbelievable. My oldest son, Nick, graduated from Notre Dame, played on the team there. He's now back at Notre Dame as an academic advisor. He's actually the coordinator of their, uh, um, uh, what do we call it, the uh, transition, the co coordinator of transition, director of transition for the athletes. When they come into school, he, he kind of oversees all the sports and what they do there. He's doing terrific. My daughter, Alexandra, just moved from New Orleans to Sacramento because her husband took a job out there. She's a wonderful child. She just had a wonderful child. He's four years old, Rocco Paul Wolf. I miss them They're in Sacramento. My daughter, Samantha, who lives right next door, lived right next door to us because we don't live there anymore. Um, she, uh, she's just the most amazing child you ever met. She is a therapist where she talks with women who have perionatal issues, and she's just terrific at it. She's become an expert in the field. And then my youngest, Tommy, or you all should know him as Dr. Tommy. He's a, he's a dentist in Baton Rouge. He's named after Tommy Lasorda, who is his godfather. And uh, they've all been there for me every step of the way. And, uh, you know, they're excited about this as well, and they can't wait to come to visit us here. So I just want you all to know that every day we go out to that ball field, we are going to give you the very best effort that we can. Um, we're going to wear that uniform with pride. We're going to, we're, we are going to represent that university with class and dignity. And if, if a player doesn't want to do it, he's just not going to be a part of the program. It's that simple. I want our players' goal. I told them yesterday, I only have one goal for every one of them. And that's for them individually to become the very best players that they can be. If that results in being an All-American, 
or a first round draft choice, a big, big leaguer, that'd be wonderful. I'd be the happiest guy in the world. This school has produced an awful lot of major leaguers. Uh, you, all you have to do is look at the history and see some of the greatest players in the country are out there. I, I got a call yesterday from Whit Merrifield, and uh, that was thrilling for me. It came out of the clear blue. Jeff Churchich, who played here many years ago, also played for my father, he sent me a text message. Uh, Adrian Morales, who played third base on national championship teams, he, he reached out to me. Um, so a lot of people that uh, went through this program and have an awful lot of, lot of, have an awful lot of pride in this program are very excited to see what the next chapter of, of uh, Carolina baseball is going to be. So I can promise you that we're going to wear this uniform with pride. I have loved everywhere I've been, um, and I know that, I, that our family is going to love Columbia, South Carolina as much as we've loved anywhere else, and you're going to get our very best effort, and hopefully we're going to put a team out there that you're going to be very, very proud of. So with that said, if we have questions, Steve, I'd be happy to answer anything. Uh, David Kloniger with the Charleston Post and Courier. What was your first name? David. David, nice to meet you, David. Welcome to Columbia, Paul. Uh, since you stepped away in 2021, there's been a couple of uh, issues that have come into the game with NIL and the transfer portal. I never, you... I never heard of that. So... <laughs> oh. How do you plan to approach those? <laughs> Well, uh, let me tell you how I'm going to approach them, okay? I'm going to lean on my coaching staff extremely hard, okay? And this is a good segue into me telling you about my coaching staff, all right? Thank you for teeing it up for me, David. First of all, um, when Ray and I first talked about this job, Ray, was, Ray, Ray talked to me about Monty Lee. Now, I didn't know Monty that well. We'd had a couple of dealings with each other when he was the coach at Clemson. Am I allowed to say that name, or do I have to refer to him as the team up north? Up north. Okay, all right. Um, when he was the coach there, we had a couple of things to discuss. But I couldn't you know, fib about this and say I really knew Monty. But Ray knows Monty really well, okay? He obviously coached against him, then he was part of his coaching staff, and then you know, they've remained very close. Ray has been a real mentor for Monty and a bit, a bit and has been a big influence on his life. So he knows him well. So I deferred to him to tell me about Monty and you know why, why is this so important? And he explained it. And as I thought about it, as Ray was explaining it to me, and then I slept on it before I gave Ray my answer, I was absolutely convinced Ray was exactly right. And I, and I knew that Ray was a really good judge of people and talent and so forth. So Monty and I ended up having a conversation because, you know, obviously there's going to be a little bit of disappointment that he didn't get this position. And I knew that he also had an opportunity to become a head coach at another school. And he's been, had, he's been a head coach for 14 years and a very successful one. But I wanted him to be a part of our coaching staff because of everything that Ray had told me about him. Well, then we had a conversation that probably lasted two hours, right, Monty, or more? And it was amazing because it was a very blunt and honest conversation on both sides. And that's the way I deal with people in a very honest way and very forthright. And as the conversation continued to morph, I could see that there was a connection there. And as we started talking about things like philosophy of the game and coaching and hitting and fielding and pitching and everything else, it was amazing to me how aligned both of us were in our beliefs about how to do things. I had total respect for the work that he's done as the interim head coach. He's basically kept the team together, and he's given me great input on, on each of the players. Um, he, he's going to be a tremendous, continue to be a tremendous part of, of uh, Carolina baseball. And I'm really happy and proud that he, that he stayed on with us. And, and OK, let it be told. I don't know how much longer I'm going to coach, and I'm sure that question is going to come. But I hope that we're going to do well enough that Monty will be ready to take over when I finish. That's how I feel about it. Terry Rooney has, and I have history together. He was my, uh, I had a pitching coach at Notre Dame for nine years by the name of Brian O'Connor. Brian is the head coach at Virginia. And when Brian left to become the head coach, it really felt like I 
my right arm was cut off. I was like walking in circles because I had no balance anymore. So the, the most important hire I ever was going to make in my coaching career was going to be who to, to replace Brian with. So I did a national search, and everybody kept telling me the name Terry Rooney. He was at the time the pitching coach at, uh, at Stetson. Were you the recruiting coordinator as well at that time, Terry? And he was the recruiting coordinator. When I met him, my God, the guy had the enthusiasm of 100 people. He's like the energizer bunny. He just never slows down. So I offered him the position. He came and joined me there. The, the other assistant I had was Cliff Godwin, who is now the head coach at East Carolina. So Terry was with me for three years at Notre Dame. Cliff was with me for one year. And then I, when I took the job at LSU, I brought both of them with me to LSU. The first year I was at LSU, we weren't very good, quite frankly. You know, there, there needed to be a real upgrade in the talent, and, um, and a lot of things had to happen. Well, Terry and, Terry and Cliff hit the ground running, and they came up with the number one recruiting class in the country my, our first year at LSU. Now, there was no transfer portal in those days, so we couldn't get immediate help, but we recruited a bunch of freshmen, a few junior college transfers. That class ended up being so critical in our second year, we went to Omaha. The third year, now Terry left me after the second year to become the head coach at Central Florida, which is of course known as UCF now, and, and he was the head coach there for eight years, Terry, for eight years, uh, and did a wonderful job. Um, but the team that he basically put together, we won the national championship with in our third year. So now as I had this opportunity that Ray was sounding like he was, he was very interested in me doing it, the only way I could have done it is if Terry joined the staff with me because I, I have so much confidence in his ability to coach players on the field. He coached a pitching staff that went to Omaha and then left the pitching staff that won the national championship for us the next year. And, and as a recruiter, there's just nobody that's going to outwork him. So the team of those two guys, Monty and Terry, are unbelievable. So the third assistant is going to be a, a man by the name of John Hendry. John is on the staff at Virginia right now working for Brian O'Connor. And he is not coached on the field with Virginia in his three years there, but in the summers he's been going off and coaching the pitchers in collegiate summer leagues. The most important thing about John is that he grew up the son of a baseball man. His father, Jim Hendry, is one of the great executives in Major League Baseball. He was the general manager of the Chicago Cubs for almost 10 years. Uh, for the last 10 years, he has been the special assistant to Brian Cashman, who runs the New York Yankees. So John grew up in that environment, in the Wrigley Field and Yankee Stadium, being around big leaguers all the time. It, it was amazing as I watched him grow up, the maturity and his knowledge and so forth. I knew that he had a tremendous career ahead of him in coaching. When I talked to him about the possibility of coming here and he was describing his work for me, I didn't realize how much he did with the transfer portal and in recruiting, just not off campus. And in fact, when I talked to Brian O'Connor about it, he used the term, John Hendry is going to be an all-star in the coaching profession. And he described to me what he would do, things like you know, daily, the coaches for Virginia would get text messages, maybe 20 of them in one day. Hey guys, so-and-so uh, -so just went in the transfer portal. I watched video on him. I think he's somebody we should be interested in, and this is the reasons why. So he's, he's ready to help. And with Terry being uh, the recruiting coordinator, I don't know, know if I mentioned that, but we're going to shift the recruiting coordinator title from Monty to, to Terry. There may be a day or two where Terry has to be on the road, might miss a practice or whatever. John Hendry, as, a, as, as an assistant pitching coach, is going to be able to step in there, and we're not going to skip a beat out there on the field because Terry's going to be mentoring John along the way too. So in answer to your question, David, long answer, 
I'm going to depend on these guys, okay? I don't, I don't know exactly how this all works, but I'm learning a lot. I've learned a lot in the last three days with these guys. I think between the two of them, I'm, I've probably had 30 conversations and another 40 text messages while I've been in Baton Rouge and they've been here. So we're going to get this thing figured out. We're going to have it, you know, have a really good plan going forward, and I'll become more and more involved as time goes on. Yes. Rick Henry, WIS-TV. Hey, Rick. Welcome to Columbia. Thank you. What, what's the key to transforming a program into one that can consistently get to the regional, super regionals, and make trips to Omaha? Well, let me say this, first of all. This program is not in the doldrums, okay? I mean, they won 37 games last year. They won three games in the SEC tournament. They won a game in the regional. They're close. There's talent on this team. I know there's talent on this team. So, you know, People say, oh, you know, how many years is going to take? Look, I don't have a three-year plan. I don't have a five-year plan. I got a one-year plan. This team, the kids that are on this team that only have one more year of eligibility, they don't care about two years from now or three years from now. We're going to go out there and do the very best that we can this coming year. And if we do a little bit more to supplement the, 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 the team that we have coming back through recruiting and transfer portal and so forth, I don't see why we can't compete for, for everything right out of the gate. I didn't come here to lose. I didn't come here to be mediocre. In my opinion, Carolina baseball represents excellence. Ray Tanner, listen, Bobby Richardson and June Raines and, and Ray Tanner, all these great coaches of the past, they, they, they didn't work so hard to build a mediocre, mediocre team. They're not happy with mediocrity, and nor will I. This is my last go around. I'm not working anywhere after here, okay? This is it. So I think we need to win now. I think we should go for it. I don't know if it's going to happen. You know, it's a tough league. I don't know if you know that, but it's a tough league, okay? And we're going to go out there and we're going to compete our you-know-what's off every day. And if we get a few breaks and, and we make it happen. But I think the attitude of the players is going to dictate everything. If they're disciplined... If they care about the little things, it starts with how they conduct themselves. It starts with how they keep the locker room. It's how they respect their facility. It's how they interact with the public. It's all those kinds of things that if they're totally dedicated to a cause and we have the discipline and maybe we teach them how to handle the pressure situations a little bit better, okay, make a big pitch, get a big hit, make a big play, run the bases, take pride in the base running. You know, it's a, it's a cumulative thing that doesn't just happen overnight. You got to do it every day. You got to be a champion every day if you really want to hold up the big trophy at the end. And those were, those were characteristics of Ray's teams when, when they were really winning big. I don't see any reason why we can't just restore that glory. And again, if we recruit the right players, coach them the right way, you know, be dedicated to them, and they're dedicated to the team. I don't see any reason why we should put limits on what we accomplish. Paul, well, Mike, you have a Gamecock Central. Hey, Mike. There's been obviously two coaches that have come in since Ray, last coach at South Carolina, and naturally people understand the expectations. I and mean, you mentioned it, just the great history. How, do, how much does it excite you knowing that this fan base is very passionate, and obviously they're going to hold you and this program to a very high level of expectations? I'm not sure if you know this or even recognize it, but I actually came from a place that's very similar, okay? Yeah. Um, I told the new coach when he took over and I met with him, I said, hey, they're going to love you until you fall behind in the first game of the year, okay? Um, you know, we didn't win every game when I was a coach at LSU. We had some disappointing moments, too. We had a lot of phenomenal success and great moments, you know, we only won one national championship. You know, Ray's got me there, okay? I need another skin on the wall to catch up with Ray, all right? Um, but sometimes people have a tendency to dwell on the negative. The sport of baseball, it's impossible to win every game. It's just impossible. The, the, you know, nobody's going to go 56 and 0. Um, you know, we're going to have, we're going to get our nose bloodied here and there, but you got to just stay the course. and. And I know that fans are going to, you know, be critical at times, all right? I've always said this when I was at LSU and, and criticism got loud. 
There's only one thing worse than criticism, and that's apathy. There's not going to be apathy among Carolina fans. There wasn't apathy among LSU fans. The criticism is not to be taken personal. It, they want to win, and I don't blame them. You know, they own season tickets. They support the baseball program. You know, they, you know, there's no Major League Baseball here. This is Major League Baseball for our fans and the people that are, are watching the games. But let me tell you this. They, they aren't going to want to win any more than I want to win, okay? And Terry and, and Monty and John, they, nobody's going to want to win more than we do. So we're going to do everything we can do to put our players in a position to be successful. That's, that's the big thing that we need to do is we need to put our players in situations that they can be most successful. I'm looking to see what players do extraordinary things. And then we're going to magnify those extraordinary things and try to keep from putting them in situations where they might have a difficult time succeeding. All right? So if we're doing all those things, the success is going to come. I'm standing in front of you here telling you we're going to win. There's no doubt in my mind about that. That's not even up for discussion. We're going to do it. We're going to get it done. But that doesn't mean every step is forward. There might be three steps forward, one step back. Five steps forward, one step back. And that's just the nature of it. But how our players deal with adversity, short-term adversity, and how our players handle success with humility and knowing that at the end of the day, you know what, tomorrow's a new day, the score starts 0-0 again, and we got to turn the page and be ready to play each and every day. So listen, I, I'm going to love our fans. I'm going to be, I'm not, look, when things aren't going good, I'm not going to be hiding in the corner of the dugout. I'll be standing out there on the top step, and I'll be the lightning rod for the criticism. I want the, I want the success to go to, the, the credit of the success to go to the players and to our staff. I'll be the lightning rod for the criticism. That's okay with me. I'm a big boy. I can handle it. Hi, Paul. Jack Veltri, GamecockCentral.com. Pleasure meeting you, sir. Nice to meet you. When it comes to analytics, because, you know, the game has changed so much right. over the years and stuff, are you the type of person that trusts his feeling and his gut versus looking at the numbers? Like, how do you kind of look at that? And I guess the second part of that question is, do you try adjusting with the times, or do you, do, do you just stick with what's kind of worked for you so well over the years? Very good question. And the answer to that is yes. I know it was an or question, but I'm saying yes. Both, okay? The analytics can be very valuable. You know, Monty took me for a tour of the hitting facility today and showed me all the cameras and the computers and all the stuff that we can do analytics. Why would you not take advantage of it? When I talked to Terry about his evolving as a pitching coach, he explained to me how important some of the analytics are to him and how he's going to work with the pitchers. So yeah, it's crazy to not use what technology can give you and the, and the advances that we have in the game. But I'm not going to totally depend on that. You know, I'm going to trust these two little white things in, in, in the front of my face. I'm going to see what I see, and I'm going to believe what I see. And I've been a pretty good judge of talent. That allowed me to last for 39 years without somebody kicking me to the curb. I've always said this. The players you choose to tie your, hit your wagon to are going to determine whether or not you're a good coach. See, I have never in 39 years as a head coach pitched one ball or hit one pitch or run the bases or caught it. It's all about the players. They're the ones that get it done or don't get it done. So I, ha I have to make the judgment on who are the players that we can really trust, especially in pressure situations. So a lot of, a lot of the analytics tell you, oh, RBIs are an important stat. To me, it's the most important stat. It doesn't do any good to get on base if we don't get those base runners around to home plate. The whole idea is the score runs, and the run differential is what matters. If it, look, does the you know, spin rate help a pitcher be more successful? Absolutely. Okay, but the idea is to get the hitter out and to limit the amount of runs that we give up. So, yeah, I'm, it's going to be a combination. And uh, I'm not going to be a dinosaur and say, oh, no, I don't care about all that other stuff because it would be silly for me to do that. And the players have grown up with that. They've started at ages 10 and 11, you know, learning about all those kinds of things. We're not going to just completely divorce ourselves from it. 
But if it came down to the bottom line of, do you play a person with good exit velocity or a guy that comes through in the clutch with a runner on third base and one out, I'm going to play the guy with the run that gets the runner in. So it's going to be a combination of both. Alan Cole, GamecocksGoop.com. Uh, you talked about your philosophy a couple questions back in one of the answers. Do you have any kind of, what do you look for in a team? You know, are there any non-negotiables in an Omaha type roster that you look for that just kind of have to be there with any team you're going to coach? So, you know, several years ago, they moved from Rosenblatt Stadium to what's now called Schwab Field. And we won the national championship in 09. When I say we, I'm sorry, LSU won the national championship in 2009 in Rosenblatt. And I told, I told Ray t today what I admired most about his championships is he won one in Rosenblatt and then he won one in the new stadium. And both fields play entirely different. Rosenblatt was a home run haven. It sat up on a hill and when the wind blew out and the fences weren't that far out, okay? It was an offensive game in Omaha. When we went to the, in 2013, to, I said we again, didn't I? Gosh, I promised myself I wouldn't do that. When LSU went to the World Series in 2013, it was our first time we played in that field, okay? I remember we played UCLA in the first game. We lost two to one. We hit four balls that would have been home runs in any park in the SEC. One went out and three were caught at the wall. And the, the, and the, the outfield was huge. It was like the Grand Canyon. I didn't realize just how big it was and how big it played. So I realized then and there that if you want to really be successful, not only in the regular season or in Omaha, you have to have diversity on your team. You have to have a lot of flexibility. So look, if, if we have to win a 13 to 12 game because we can slug the ball out of the park or because we fell behind in a game by a few runs and we need to battle back and you got to battle back with, with some long balls with a couple of guys on base, I want to have a team that's capable of doing that. On the other hand, if the wind is blowing in or you're playing in a big ballpark or you're facing a super duper pitcher where hits aren't going to be easy to get, you got to be able to manufacture as well. So the non-negotiables are we're going to be a good base running team, okay? And we're going to have a few guys in the lineup that can hit the ball out of the ballpark, without a doubt. But we're also going to have a few guys in the lineup that can handle the bat, that can bunt, that don't, they don't strike out, they hit the ball to the opposite field. They're just that gritty, hard-nosed, tough out that we all love to see. Um, I like to have fast guys that maybe we can steal a base. And without question, one thing that I will never give in on is we're going to have a good defensive team. Because if we want to have a great pitching team, you better have great defense behind them. Because it's impossible to be a great pitching team if you don't put, catch the ball behind them. And, that, and we're going to do that. I'll coach the infielders. So if our infielders don't catch the ball and throw it to first base accurately, you can point the finger at me. I can promise you it won't be because we're not going to work hard enough at it. So any of those infielders sitting out there, you better strap it on, okay? Um, uh, Monty is going to work with the outfielders. Uh, I'll work with the infielders. We're not sure yet who's going to work with the catchers. We're trying to figure that out right now. And, of course, Terry will have the pitching staff. But I just want to have a complete team, you know, and, and be able to do it in every way. I'm not big on oh, we're going to walk more than anybody else. You know, I love to give the green light. I like to see hitters swing from their heels when they get a cripple pitch coming in. And I don't want our pitchers to fall behind on hitters because I don't want the other team doing that to us. But at the same time, you know, love to manufacture. I know that hit and run plays kind of been put in the closet. I'm going to break it out of the closet and see if we can execute a few of those. John Whittle, TheBigSpur.com. Hey, John. You mentioned that, you know, the program's not too far off, but it has been a while since South Carolina was able to compete in the SEC for, for championships. What do you see in your viewpoint so far in just a short time is, is kind of the biggest hurdle, biggest barrier to getting there? Uh, well, I think the league is getting tougher every year. <laughs> There's a lot of great teams out there. And, um, you know, it, let me tell you something. One year I went as a coach, our team went at LSU, our team went 13 and 17. We didn't make the SEC tournament. There was only eight teams that went that year. I think that was 2011, okay? Two years later, we went 17 and 13. 
We were a national seed. Four game difference. 36 and 21 year to 40 and 16 the next. Four game difference in conference, four game difference overall. Went from not making the tournament to national seed. So, so the difference is razor thin. You know, you, you win a few one run games and you're, you're having a good year. That's the key. You gotta win the close ones. You gotta, and the only way to win the close ones is with clutch hitting, poise on the mound and on defense late in the game, and a belief that, they're, that you're gonna finish the game off. And if I, there's a, that's one of the things that, quite frankly, we've been proud about in our career is we've won a lot of close games. And I think it'll make the difference in the season.